All right, everyone, we'll begin our session. I hope that everyone's here to learn about precision and data preparation. If not, you are in the wrong room. I regret to inform you. <laughs> All right, assuming uh, no one's left, we are in the right location. Excellent. I am so happy to have all of you here and our esteemed panelists. This is an issue in management that applies to everyone and if done improperly can affect the field and the people who rely on our conclusions. And so what our panelists study are, is extremely valuable to us and I think just by you guys being here you also understand the value of it. And so we're going to hear from um, the experts in the field. And so we will go in an order of first we'll, the panelists will introduce their topics and then we'll enter into a prepared question section followed by audience questions so if you have any pressing questions you can raise your hand but if not i would recommend you save it for the audience questions um, and without further ado i would like the panelists to take a moment to introduce themselves hi my name is justin DeSimon. i am an associate professor at the university of alabama i uh, have a couple of different roles with an academy I'm Executive for uh, the Research Methods Division, very heavily involved with Karma and with ORM as well. And I've done a lot of work on just data cleaning and data quality, and so that's what I will be presenting today. Oh, hi, everyone. I'm Bo. I'm from the University of Illinois, Rene Champagne. So I'm currently an assistant professor of industrial psychology. I hold joint appointments in the psych department and also School of Labor and Employment Relations. So my research is a mix of methodological research and also substantive topics. For my methodological research, I did a lot of things related to hyperstyle theory, structural regression modeling, multi-level analysis, and for my uh, substantive research is about you know, personality, how broadly defined personality and how personality can be applied to selection, can be applied to you know, uh, all your researches. Hi, I'm Marcia Simmery. I'm a professor of management at Louisiana Tech University. Most of my research these days is on common method variants. I'll be talking on that today. Hello, I'm Greg uh, from Finland. I'm associate professor of entrepreneurship at University Vastula, which is right in the middle of the country. And uh, I'll be talking about transformations, uh, which is based on my methodological research, which concerns all kinds of topics related to all kinds of modeling. And uh, this is a uh, based on parts of my, my work on visualizing, visualizing models. And he's also a YouTuber who is recording our session today. We <laughs> post on our YouTube channel, so you're part of the uh, zeitgeist. Yeah, I, I was going to say during my presentation, but I guess it's uh, since I'm fourth, it's, it's good idea to bring it up now. If someone wants to say something and that doesn't want to be posted online, please let me know and I, I'll edit you up. Hello, good morning. I'm Ryan Gottfordson. I'm an associate professor at Cal State Fullerton, where I do largely leadership research, and all that's connected into method stuff as well. So, and I'm here to tell you a little bit about outliers. Fantastic. Yeah, we can pass it on down that way. That's okay. All right. So, um, we're going to begin the panelist topic introduction section. They're each going to present the topic that they are experts in. Um, and they have been assigned eight to nine minutes. At nine minutes, I will be cutting them off. Um, so it's rather intense. They've been asked to address specific questions, including what is the topic and what are some ways to address it. Um, and they've added some additional things that you will find very useful. Um, and I should say at the end of the presentation is a link that you can use your phone to scan or you can write down the link or you can use my email address and you will have access to the slides as well as the prepared materials that our panelists have prepared including some referred readings, some articles, and things that you might find useful as you go through your data preparation journey. So um, the way that the, the panel was organized, I did my best to start with who would, um, what topics you would start first as you go through your survey data collection, uh, data analysis. And so we start with DeSimon, who is covering topics of careless responding, which is something often you have to think of in advance before as you're designing your survey. So without further ado, if you would like to take it off. Right. So hello. Again, I'm Justin DeSimon, and I'm going to cover careless responding in surveys. So 
generally speaking, we want to believe that when we give someone a survey, they are giving us data that actually reflects who they are, they're standing on a construct, so forth and so on. There's a lot of ways that that can go wrong. They can not participate in the survey at all, they can leave a lot of things blank, or they can respond with what we would call kind of content irrelevant responses. And so careless responding is what I like to call it because it rolls off the tongue nicely, but it's also been called insufficient effort responding. I really also like calling it dirty data for the alliteration. Um, some journals don't love that. But yes, uh, it's been called satisficing in certain forms as well. And some of my research has shown that although it's often assumed that carelessness is just carelessness, there are actually a lot of different forms that it can take. So you probably went through high school and made, made fun of people for probably putting on standardized tests A, B, C, B, A, B, C, B, B, C, B, A, et cetera, et cetera, or trying to spell out words with those four letters. Uh, if you're filling out a personality survey and you're doing that, you're probably not answering it well. You can also just pick random responses. You could pick the same response over and over and over again. And so whether it's random responding, humans are not really random, but you know, just picking things seemingly at random, or you know, I haven't picked A in a while, so I should probably pick A. I haven't picked the middle of the scale in a while, that sort of thing, without actually paying attention to the content. That could be ramp, what we would call random responding. Straight lining is a straight line of consecutive identical responses. And pattern responding is, you know, drawing Christmas trees or things like that on your alters form. And so my work has shown that these forms are all careless and all bad, but not necessarily in the same way. So random responding does different things psychometrically than pattern responding or straight lining does. Random responding basically, uh, you know, whether you assume a normal distribution of randomness or you assume a uniform distribution of randomness, not that humans follow either one of those, can generally decrease inner item correlations, which has, of course, uh, implications for factor analysis, implications for uh, reliability estimates, so forth and so on. Basically, everything like everything tanks, everything goes to zero. And so this is very, very common. Uh, you know, five or 10% of careless respondents do this. Uh, and we've got estimates that up to 60% of our respondents do this at certain points during the survey for small periods of time. This is very, very hard to detect. The, you know, I, I call this the interocular impact test, which I stole from one of my grad school, school professors. And that's just where you look at it and it hits you right between the eyes. You can look at that pattern. That pattern doesn't necessarily look like it's random. It could be somebody responding carefully or carelessly or things like that. Straight line you can very easily see. And you can identify this with that interocular impact uh, test. This is going to make your interactive correlations go all the way up to one because when you answer an item and you answer the next item, they're going to be exactly the same. You can very easily predict one answer from any other answer since there's no variation whatsoever. Um, yeah. It'll give you a perfect first factor. It'll give you a really weird looking interactive correlation matrix. And generally speaking, it's going to raise those statistics. So fewer people do this. That's the good news. But it takes fewer people doing this to mess up your data, to mess up your psychometric estimates, et cetera. So that's the bad news. So the random responding one, more people do, and it takes more of them to screw you up. The straight lining thing, fewer people do, but it takes fewer of them. Less than 5% of these people doing this all the way through your survey can completely uh, give you uh, bad factor analytic results for alphas or things like that. So we detect the careless responding in a number of different ways. I've got a ton of different uh, references that I've put in there that you can get at the link at the end. But generally speaking, we try to diagnose this beforehand by designing surveys in a way that are not going to bore people to death and make them want to carelessly respond or not want to respond well. So a lot of people, I don't know how many surveys you guys have given, but I've been told that my surveys are very boring and repetitive. And so <laughs> if people are responding to boring and repetitive things, then they're going to lose interest. They you know, might not uh, take it seriously anymore. They might lose that focus and attention. Um, they could be distracted listening to Spotify or browsing Reddit or looking at the, you know, the YouTube uh, recording of this while they were filling out the survey. And <laughs> if they do that, they might not be paying attention to the survey like we would hope they would. Uh, we, this careless responding has also been related to being tired. It's been related to, you know, low levels of agreeableness, low levels of conscientiousness, as you might imagine, people who take things seriously and do a good job 
don't generally carelessly respond. And so if you can get, uh, if you can make your survey bright and new and interesting and fun, you can probably get rid of this, but that is much easier said than done. So other solutions are uh, uh, that uh, are related to deterring are you can switch up your response formats. And I don't just mean from strongly disagree to strongly agree, and then the next one being from never to always and still on a five point scale. Throw in some open ended items, throw in some short answer stuff. Put your demographic stuff in the middle of the survey so that they stop just clicking those radio buttons and have to enter things in. That doesn't necessarily make it interesting, but it does kind of break up the monotony of responding to the same type of item over and over and over again. Uh, you can always stare at the people, you can threaten the people, IRPs don't really like that, but generally you want to give them an incentive to respond in the way that you need them to respond. Um, you, can always, you can always measure fewer things and shorten your item or, or shorten your questionnaires, but that has negative implications for reliability and for validity. And so if you are making your measure worse, then you might be kind of throwing up your data with that longer. All right, detecting careless responding. I've got just a quick chart here. There are a number of different ways you can do it. There have been no less than nine best practices articles written on uh, careless responding. I'm guilty, I wrote one of them, uh, so I'm part of the problem, or solution, or whatever you want to call it. And generally, you can go ahead and read any of these things, there's a whole book on it if you want to really geek out about it. But yes, uh, for random responding, throw in some items that uh, say things like, I get paid bi-weekly by leprechauns, or I've been to every country on Earth. Technically, the, you could go to every country on Earth, but most of your survey participants haven't. My favorite one is, I was born on February 30th. Yeah, since that's impossible, you know, anybody who agrees with that is probably either not paying attention or lying to you, and neither one of those things is good for your data. Uh, you can time people. Careless responders tend to go very fast. Uh, you can put in psychometric synonyms uh, or semantic synonyms, give the same items twice and then correlate those, or give semantically synonymous items and correlate those. And then there's other uh, ways of doing it as well. The quick and easy one here is time and bogus and instructed items. Those also work for all three of these types of perilous responding, so that is really, really good. Um, there is also uh, straight lining where you can use those. You can use psychometric antonyms, so opposite uh, types of items. And if they say the same thing to two antonymous items, then they're probably not paying attention. You can also just count the number of consecutive and uh, invariant responses called long string, or take the variance of those responses. And then uh, for pattern responding, you can look at outliers through Mahalanobis SD. You can use uh, Markov chains. There's a best paper, best student paper, or best paper work with RMD that used that. Um, that paper is actually, I think, under review right now. Um, and so that will be out hopefully soon. Um, it's not my paper, but I like that. So, yes. Um, some other considerations are uh, whether getting rid of carelessness causes you missing this problem. You may have noticed that we are missing a section on missingness in this, uh, in this <laughs> session, and uh, sorry about that, we, we tried, but yeah, uh, those people did not show up. So yes, generally, uh, if you are kicking people out in a systematic way, you might be causing a missingness problem, where it's missing at random or missing not at random, which can bias your data. You can take a look at that interplay between the uh, screening techniques and response sets. Are there people who have like a middling response uh, method? Are there people who have an extreme response style? And are they more likely to be generally carelessly responding? Or do they really just love, 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 love their job and can't get enough of it? So you can balance your items, positive and negative wording for items. There's some debate over what that does for the factor structure and things like that. But it's very, very good for things like response sets and careless responding. And then consider your cutoffs very carefully. This is true for every statistic that you have ever heard of. And so make sure that you are choosing them a priori so that you're not just data mining. Make sure that you're doing ethically. Make sure that you are essentially thinking about the cutoffs and what they mean. Um, and you know, sometimes your reviewers will make you do a sensitivity analysis and say, what about this cutoff or that cutoff? That's perfectly fine as well. Finally, and this one seems really obvious, but a lot of people just don't do it. Take your own survey. If you get bored with it, and that's the thing that you study and are super passionate about, I guarantee that your participants are going to be bored with it as well. So yes, if you can't get through your own survey, that is not a good sign for avoiding carelessness, laziness, and apathy when it comes to your survey. And that's all I've got. So I assume we're taking questions at the end. Yes. Yeah.
And that was such a good presentation, you probably don't have any anyway. So. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Okay, hello everyone. So today I'm going to talk about a more specific problem because my research is uh, about personal selection. So I, this problem is specific to using personality tests in the selection context studies. You know, nowadays, more and more organizations are using personality tests for selection because it is personality can robustly predict you know future job performance. At the same time, it results in almost no average impact. So it's a, pro it's a pretty good solution to the traditional use of cognitive ability assessment. But one big problem of using personality tests in selection context is actually it's very easy to manipulate the answers. For example, if you are applying for a sales test position, you know that this position requires someone to be extroverted. But even if you are an introvert, so when you are completing this personality test in a selection context, you might appear to be more extroverted. And then this inflation is what we call faking. Faking actually, because of the faking, so the score we obtain is no longer a true representation of your true personality, which means it's invalid. So if the scores are invalid, that means everything we did based on the scores are also invalid, including every conclusions. And then so basically today, of course, there are many, many different ways to deal with the faking. Ideally speaking, if we could devise some approach to stop people from faking at the beginning, that's going to be the best. But it's not always feasible. Sometimes we have to deal with data that has been contaminated by faking to some degree. And then in this case, what can we do? Can we still do something to rescue the data? So this is today I'm going to talk about using a uh, a little complex IRT model trying to see how we still rescue some true percentage scores from faking contaminated personality data. So even though I uh, I situated this uh, project in the faking context, but I think it also can be applied to social media disorder responding, which is also a big concern for many of us. But then today I'm just going to use faking as an example, just to make sure you know that this method should be also be able to re uh, partially resolve the issue of social media disorder responding. So anyway, so the, uh, the model I'm, I'm going to be talking about today is called Retrieve, Edit, and Select Model. Uh, so, uh, you know, in the faking literature, there has been a lot of studies, decades of studies focusing on how to detect or correct for faking. For example, someone has, has a lot of research has proposed to use a separate social, social disability scales to capture faking. Someone has mentioned that we can use focus items to capture faking. Capture faking. We can also use response time to identify fakers, where you can use person fit index from item response theory trying to capture fakings. Of course, there are many other approaches, but actually, there are some common drawbacks of these previous methods. The first one is they are kind of heuristics. Actually, we don't know exactly why it should work in a theoretical sense. And secondly, actually, all of these approaches they ignore that actually faking is a pretty com you know uh, complex cognitive process. So actually these approaches, they ignore the sequential cognitive process involved in the faking you know, situation. And also, you know, for personality items, some items are more likely to induce faking than some other items. For example, for neutral items, probably people will not fake. But for very desirable items, people are more likely to fake. So there are also inter-item difference in terms of the degree to which they will induce faking, but none of these previous methods take into consideration of this factor. And finally, and more importantly, is like most of these previous methods, they didn't give us a faking free personality scores. So it probably for many of us, it is okay with the first three limitations. But for the last one, it's really important because we do need faking free personality scores to do anything else we want with the personality scores. So if we want to uh, if we want to overcome these drawbacks, so what do we need? So we actually need two things. So first one is we actually need a theoretical model that articulates the cognitive process online faking. So basically that means we really need to understand how people fake in order to correct or detect faking. So but for now, we don't have a good model to do it. At the same time, after we have the theoretical model, we should also have a statistical model that will mathematically formalize the theoretical model so that we can really analyze our data. So we need these two types of models. So when I was, you know, when I first, you know, encountered this question, I was thinking, oh, what can I do? So actually, instead of, you know, trying to, you know, crack my brain to get some models out of my head, I just go to the literature. I searched very, very broadly. And actually, in the cognitive psychology area, there has been a model that is called the activation, decision, construction, and action model. The name is not sexy, but it's a very useful model. 
And actually, this model was originally designed to describe how people think, how people you know, involved in deception in a high stakes situation, like in a forensic setting, if you want to tell a lie, what's the problem in the process. But actually, I find this model, as we will explain later, is I think it's very, very applicable to fatal impersonality tests. So now I will use a simple example to show how this model works. So basically, these four letters, act, activation, decision, construction, and action, do refers to the four stages of faking. They are sequential stages. So now I will just use an example. Let's imagine that you know, Bojack Horseman is applying for a manager's position. And then he needs to complete a personality test. And now he's answering this item. I still don't get emotional. So let's use this example to show how this, the essence of this theoretical model. So basically, according to this AdCamp model, the first step when you see this item, it will actually you will active it's an activation of choose. So basically, you will in your inner heart you will see okay, what's my true response to this item? In this case, probably for Bojack, it's going to be disagree, I think. And then after you you know this choose for you know inner evaluation, and then you need to think about the context. In this way, you know Bojack really needs to really wants to get this job. I think that's. That applies to most job applicants. We really want to get this job. And then we know that for this position, for a successful manager, probably need to be more emotionally stable to be a good manager. And then in this case, you will know that, you know, if I say uh, disagree to this item, I might not get this job. So in this case, in the second stage is you need to make a de decision. You need to decide whether you want to edit your, your initial response or not. If, of course, if not, if you want to stay true to yourself, you just say, okay, disagree, that's your true response. And then at the third stage, it's like, if you decide, okay, I need to modify my response to increase my chance of being selected, and then in this case, you're gonna go to the third stage, that's construct the line. So basically, you need to decide what, what you, what's gonna be your final choice you're gonna put down the answer key. And then finally, of course, the last step is basically deliver your final response. In this case, for example, strongly agree. So this is the essence of the activation, decision, construction, and action model. So basically, it specifies four stages. And then, so I think this model describes really well about how a person fakes in the uh, personality test. And then now, what we need is a mass math model that, that can formalize the previous four processes. And then, again, I search the literature, and then I'm glad that I, I I read Psychometrica regularly, so actually I know this paper. Actually, this paper was published uh, in the same year as a previous paper, as we will see later. The two are really, really, almost 95% you know, well aligned with each other, but they were published in the same year, and they didn't cite each other. That means they were developed independently. So it's really exciting to see how the thoughts of cognitive psychologists and the psychometrician, they converge to the same point. I think that's the beauty of doing psychometrics. So basically, according to this model, I will use a graphic illustration to, uh, to illustrate this called the retrieve edit and selection model. Still, let's use this example. I seldom get emotional as an example. And then I, let's say for this scale we use, we have four response options from strongly disagree to strongly agree. As we can see, oh, the RES model specifies three processes. The first one is retrieve, the green one. The second stage is edit, which is the uh, blue one, and then oh. Color has changed. Okay, the last stage is the selection stage, the select stage. So according to this model, if let's say if your initial response is strongly agree, and actually in this case there is no need for you to pick because you already your true response is already very desirable. And then so in this case you just select your true response. And then let's say if your initial response is agree three, and then you need to make a decision whether you want to edit your response or not. Of course, you can stay true to yourself and then just respond, you know, agree. But then you can also decide to, I need to look even more positive and then I would decide to further edit my response and then in this case, I would choose to uh, choose a strongly agree. So the same applies to if your original response was disagree or strongly agree. So basically, this, this plot shows the cognitive process of, you know, of how people respond to personality, uh, how people think in this case. And then here we have three stages. And remember here, actually, only the last stage, the select stage, is something we can observe. For both the retrieval stage and the edge stage, is something we theorize, but we cannot observe. They are latent stages. And then you might ask, well, this is super complicated. How can we? Because we, what we have is only the observed data. How can we get from the observed data to the, all the stages? 
And then in this case, basically it comes to a question of how can we model the probability of each observed response. And then in this case, as we can see here, for example, if your final observed response is four, there are actually three possibilities, for example, four possibilities. Your initial response is four, and then your initial response is three, but you choose four. And your initial response is two, you choose four, similarly for the same one. So basically, as we can see, we can, and then we can model the probability of each pass here. But the good thing is, according to this model, each pass, they are independent from each other. That means if we can, we just, we can just add up the probability of each pass to have an estimate of the probability of the final observed response. So in this way, we can model these probabilities. And then, of course, you might ask me, how can we model these probabilities? And then here, we have, for example, along each path, we have three nodes. And then we're going to model the probability of each node and multiply them to get the probability of each pass. And then we add the probability of each pass to have derived the probability for the final observed response. So conceptually, this is how it works. So as we can see, actually, this model is quite close to the theoretical model I described. The retrieval stage is basically the activation stage. The end stage is the decision stage, and then the selector stage is a, com com uh, is a, is a combination of the, uh, of, of, the, uh, of the selection and action stage in the uh, LCAP model. And then, of course, if you are interested in formulas, I have one slice of formula here. If you are interested, this is how this formula works, but I'm not going to go into details of this formula. It took me a long time to figure them out. And then, I'm here. So basically, according to RES model, we have three stages. And then, for each stage, we're going to use an item response theory model to calculate the probability. For the retrieve stage, it is basically the only responding stage. And then for this stage, we're going to use a gradient response model to model this latent, uh, latent stage. And then from this, from, the first, from this stage, we're going to have an estimate of your true personality. So this is how this model can separate your true personality from your fake responses. And then at the second stage, because it's just a decision, you decide whether you want to add your answer or not. It's a dichotomous decision. And then in this case, we're going to use a two-parameter logistic model, which is like the most one used IoT model for dichotomous data. And then from this stage, it is your faking tendency that determines the probability of your decision. And then so basically from this stage, we can get a second person parameter estimate, which is re represent your faking tendency. And then in the last stage, is basically if you already decided to fake, how much do you fake? And then in this case, it is going to be your faking intensity. And then so in this stage, we're going to have another person parameters. So basically from this model, we can not only separate your true personality from your fake response. At the same time, we can also estimate your fake intensity and also faking uh, tendency from the data. And then we can use these additional estimates to conduct some further analysis. For example, is faking itself predictive of your performance? Is faking related to some other personality traits? So this model actually, I think, is uh, it opens the door to assume uh, to many other interesting questions. <laughs> okay, cool. So I will just quickly, quickly go through this. Okay, here I will just show you how this model is super complex. So it can be quite hard to estimate this model. So I spent six months figuring out the Bayesian codes. So look, this is just part of the screenshot. So actually, the real code is actually even longer. So, but actually, don't worry. As a user, you don't need to do this. I have, I have done all the work, so you don't need to worry about this. So, as a user, here is what you have to do. First, install this two pack, R package, S stand and also R stand, and second, just write the following code. So, as a user, that's what you need to do. So, don't worry about the. I, I already, I have already done the dirty work. So, here is what you need to do. It should, so, it should be accessible. And of course, I have done a bunch of simulation studies to show that this model works in reasonable conditions. But of course, you know, no model is going to work in all the conditions. So for this model to work, you need to have some items that are easily fakeable and also some, some items that are not easily fakeable. So basically, it's just like in a cognitive test. You need to have some easy items and also some difficult items in order to measure people accurately. If all your items are super easy or are super difficult, actually this test is not going to be useful. So the same applies here. Okay, so that's all my presentation. So if you have any questions, just let me know. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Marcia Simmering. I just want to thank Amber for organizing this so well. She made it very easy. She designed the slides. It was a great experience. Also, all of my slides are available uh, with the QR code at the end of the presentation. 
I make a lot of assertions here that you may have never heard of regarding common method variants. They're all rooted in the literature and empirical evidence, and I have citations and articles for everything that I've got. So please follow through with that. I've been working in the area of common method variants for quite some time now, and one thing that I've noticed about this, and I'll define it here, variance that is attributable to the measurement method rather than to the constructs or the measures that are assumed to represent. But many people look at common method variance as kind of a special or intense or unique type of error. I'm here to tell you it's just one more type of error. If we look at classical test theory, the observed score, of course, is comprised of the true score and error, and one of those errors could be common method variance. It is no more special than any other error. It is specifically a response error, like we might have with insufficient effort responding or faking. Where common method variance becomes problematic is when it becomes common method bias, and I do not conflate the two of these. They are two different things. Common method bias occurs when CMV produces significant divergence between true and observed relationships. So we don't necessarily have biased data if common method variance is in it. So what are the consequences of ignoring common method variance? Uh, well, common method bias, not just variance, can inflate or deflate substantive relationships. We can indeed see that our results are not accurate. There may be type 1 or type 2 error. But it's important to note that common method variance does not always cause common method bias. So sometimes ignoring it is no big deal. Unfortunately, editors and reviewers believe that ignoring it is the death knell for your paper. You've got to deal with common method variance if you have same source cross-sectional data. I want to talk to you about how to handle that. With data preparation, I would encourage you to start with the most reliable and valid way to collect data, regardless of what might happen with common or uncommon method variants. In other words, what is the best source for each construct? What is the best timeline for data collection? What is the best method for collecting data? Is it observation or surveys? And how can you structure your survey to promote accurate responses? You must start there because you should not give up the most reliable and valid way to collect data as a means to avoid common method variants, which may or may not affect your data. Once you've done that, then you identify the possible threats posed by common method variants and uncommon method variants, things like common rater effects, where if I'm one person taking a survey all in one sitting that has the independent and dependent variables, my mood or my affect might influence my responses. I might draw connections theoretically. And there are other things like characteristics of the items or the context. Uh, the highly cited Podsikoff article has a great illustration of all of these. But again, start with how your data should best be collected most reliably and validly before worrying about common method variants. Then you can avoid, mitigate, or detect. If it makes sense, you can collect multi-source data or collect data at more than one time period. Those will help you avoid most of the common rater effects that would cause common method variants. Interestingly, not a lot of people talk about this, but there is research that an experimental design can create that um, technique that avoids common method variants because you've got interventions, because you've got people assigned to different conditions. If you can't avoid, then you can mitigate by using warnings and instructions, much like you might do with insufficient effort responding, perhaps by creating a psychological separation, maybe put those demographic items in the middle of your survey. Uh, you might use different scale anchors, where instead of five point scale, you use seven point, or you use likely instead of agree. And although this is uh, undersighted, the use of moderators or mediators can mitigate common method variance effects. There are a couple of articles out there that indicate your findings cannot be produced, your findings with a moderator cannot be produced by common method variants. So if you've got a moderator and you find findings, it's a real finding. It's not from common method variants. And the citations, again, are in my presentation. Or you can detect post hoc. I would say start, though, by including an ideal marker variable and use the CFA marker technique. Uh, this is empirically the most efficacious way to look for common method variants. You can also successfully use a directly measured latent variable. I'll talk about that in a minute. 
or the white juice approach, which is include 40 filler items and look for response tendencies. Put differently, don't do these three tests. I know everybody loves the unlatent, unmeasured latent method construct technique. Uh, under a thousand subjects, it's not very effective. It produces both type one and type two errors. Um, I would recommend instead using the CFA marker te technique, the directly measured method construct, uh, that's including something like social desirability or affectivity and measuring that. The problem there is if you've got a model in which affectivity or social desirability is an important and meaningful construct, you might not want to control for that. And then the white dress techniques of response styles. So there's a lot of empirical evidence as to what works versus what doesn't work. And the ones that work require including that ideal marker variable ahead of time. So that's why I'm in the middle of this talk. You gotta think about it ahead of time, think about it after the effect. So what's the danger of ignoring common method variance in your data? I really should have included another title here that says, not much. I'm of the belief that we have way overblown the effects of common method variance and people are far too afraid of it. And it's for these reasons. First, unreliability in your measures offsets inflating common method variance. And therefore, it takes a large amount of common method variance to create common method bias. You can have common method variance in your data, but it's probably not going to tell you that your findings are statistically significant when they're not. And again, I've got a couple of articles where you can see this in action, the Lance article and uh, one of mine, uh, Fuller et al. Most levels of scale reliability and management research would offset inflationary common method variance. So here again, no big deal if you've got a little CMV. Second, complex models, interactive effects, mediators, quadratic effects, many different variables in your model mitigate CMV and avoid type one error. If you look at most research today, it's more than four or five variables. Many times it's a mediator or a moderator. Already we're mitigating common method variance there. Probably not much we need to do above and beyond that. Some of the data that I have collected in my own research shows that even when I try to get common method variance in my data, in fact, I have a study I published in which we tried to get people to respond in a consistent manner. We used a student group that was highly susceptible. We gave them positively worded items that were all on the same uh, Likert scale and encouraged them to look for these connections. We found common method variance. We didn't find common method bias. And I've seen this in three different studies that I've done where there are perfect conditions for common method variance. Yes, we find common method variance. No, we never find common method bias. So what's the danger of not doing anything about common method variance? Really not much, in my opinion. However, the rest of the field I don't think has kind of caught up with that. It's hard to get your paper published if you have common method variance. So reading more of this literature, including that ideal marker variable ahead of time, doing some of these things should be effective for you. Thank you. All right. She's not on. No. Yeah. I'm going to stand by the slides so you don't have to uh, switch between me and the slides. So uh, improving the understanding of transformations and uh, this is based on, yeah, it's incorrect clicker. That one, yeah, that works. Uh, if you're interested in, in uh, a longer version of this talk, I recorded about the 50 minute version of the talk uh, on my YouTube channel uh, on the night before leaving. And uh, it's also available in Finnish if you prefer that one. Uh, <laughs> And also, if you watch, then uh, you are not limited to reach to, uh, to, to one million, which I should break like <laughs> a week or so. so. So please contribute. Let's get to the talk. Uh, normality is often this. ...presented the information that I'm going to cover uh, pretty easily accessible here in this article um, and I'm just going to stay largely at a high level as we dive into this and ultimately my purpose in what I'm sharing with you is not necessarily walk through the nuts and bolts but to maybe give you some things to think about the strategy in which you should have when you are approaching outliers. 
And to get into this, I want to show you a, a short little video clip. Uh, this is Sean Aker and part of his TED Talk, The Happiness Advantage. Have any of you seen this by chance? All right. So here's a fun little uh, intro into how uh, at least he thinks about outliers. When I first started talking about this research outside of academia and out with companies and schools, the very first thing they said to never do is to start your talk with a graph. The very first thing I wanted to do is start my talk with a graph. This graph looks boring, but this graph is the reason that I get excited to wake up every morning. And this graph doesn't even mean anything. It's fake data. What we found is... <laughs> If I got this data back sending you here in the room, I would be thrilled because there's very clearly a trend that's going on there and that means that I can get published, which is all that really matters. <laughs> the fact that there's one weird red dot that's up above the curve, there's one weird in the room, you know who you are, I saw you earlier. <laughs> that's no problem. That's no problem as most of you know because I can just delete that dot. I can delete that dot because that's clearly a measurement error and we know that's a measurement error because it's messing up my data. <laughs> Pretty good, right? We've got all kind of been there with that. Uh, by the way, I think this is my most favorite TED Talk of all time. So if you haven't seen it, I, I recommend it in its entirety. So I actually want to start a little bit different than how, how uh, others. So I want to talk about, I think we basically know what outliers are. I'm going to define them more in just a little bit. But let me start by talking about the consequences of these. So if we've got this figure here, we've got these little black dots. Let's just say that's our core data. And if we were to add in outliers in different positions here, uh, such as the, the box, what that does is that uh, the slope stays the same, the relationship stays the same, but the R squared will now go down. If we're looking at the star being added, now the R squared goes up and the slope stays the same. And if we're looking at the triangle, now our slope is completely different, and then of course the R squared would go down. So all of these things are rather problematic to our data, but depending on how we look at this. So there's three challenges when it comes to outliers, and this is in terms of our strategy, is we uh, need to think about how we define them, how we identify them, and how we handle them. So I'm going to walk you through that at a high level. So let's start with defining them. I think at a very basic level, of course, as you know, outliers are data points that deviate markedly from others. But I want you to think about that there's three different types of outliers. Um, one type of outlier is an error outlier. Liar. These are literal errors in the data for a variety of reasons. There are interesting outliers. These are legit data points that may be of interest in study. And then there are influential outliers. These are legit data points that have a disproportionate influence on the substantive conclusions of our analysis. So when we think about, so let's, let's lay that as the groundwork. Let's now move into how we identify them. How we want to identify them is we actually want to take it in a stepwise fashion, uh, starting with error outliers. So we've got our data. The first thing we want to do is we want to uh, be able to look at if there's any of these data points that are far out there and determine whether or not these are legit or not. Um, so there's different visual tools we could use, like scatter plots, and leak plots, etc. cetera, uh, and with the other methodologies that will allow us to look at different predictor scores or residual scores. And we just need to identify the things that may be a little bit weird, and that allows us to dive in further and say, okay, are these legit or not for whatever reason? Um, so that's where we'll start. Next, then, if we identify an outlier in that process, and it is legit, then we need to consider what is interesting about this. Um, now, that might not be exactly what we're after with this particular study, but one of the things that I found in my research is when I am studying those legit kind of outlier things, it leads to new learnings and to more research questions. Uh, so they can be very valuable and something that we should definitely consider. And then third, if, we, okay, if we're not going to study them, at least not right now, then we need to assess to what degree is this outlying data point influential on the analyses that I'm doing. And there's different techniques. To, to be able to do this. So what we're looking at here is, are these data points messing with my data? So how do we identify influential outliers? Well, we're looking for two different types of influential outliers. One is a model fit outlier. These are data points that mess with our model fit. And then there's prediction outliers. These are outliers that alter our parameter estimates. Um, so one, does, it, uh, does removal change the model fit? That would be a big indication of model fit outliers. And then depending upon our statistical technique, there's a variety of different tools or, or, or things that are out there that we could utilize to identify 
to what degree did these data points alter our parameter estimates? So that then, if, if, there, if we do have data points and they're altering either our model fit or our prediction outliers, and they're legit, what do we do about them? That gets us into how do we handle the data. And the basic premise here is whatever we do, we want to be transparent and report our results with the outlier and without the outlier or whatever technique that we use to deal with that. So there's three different kind of ways to handle. We could just re-specify the model. And again, if we do that, we want to report the model, original model versus the re-specified re model. We could remove the outlier altogether. That's simple. Let's just delete it. But we're going to want to report, okay, we removed an outlier and here's the results. And of course, you'd explain why you did that. And then there's a variety of robust approaches, depending upon your methodology, that allows you to maybe shrink it down uh, or its effect uh, or weaken its effect on the model. And, and you would have to justify that, but you would still want to report your results with or without that approach. So the key here is transparency. And, and that's what readers want to see. That's what reviewers want to see. That's what journals want to see. Um, so that's the basic approach. So that's just kind of general strategy is let's, how do we find it? How do we identify it? How do we handle it? And then if you want uh, kind of different, all sorts of the different approaches for identification and handling, all the resources are in that article. So thank you. All right, thank you so much. So now we're going to move into our prepared question section of the session. And we're going to give maybe about 10 minutes of this. I allow the speakers to speak maybe just a little bit longer because it seemed like they were really in the zone and it seemed really important to what they had in comparison to maybe some of the questions that I prepared. So um, I made some of those decisions. But for the first question, if we can get some feedback on the panel first on how do we encourage better transparency and use regarding data preparation? Yeah, and please use the mic. Everybody's water over. I'm sorry. I'm going to speak to this about common method variance. I've done a couple of papers where my co-authors and I have reviewed published articles to see what people did in regards to common method variance. The number of times that authors said things like, "We did a uh, an analysis to look for common method variance and didn't find it," and that's all they said was very high. So if you're going to do something to test for common method variance, tell what you tested with. If you used a marker variable, tell what your marker variable is. I know that journal space is very limited, but it's really hard for a reader to understand the value of your data preparation unless they can tell what you did with it. So the idea of transparency, even if it's an online supplement or a footnote, tell what test you used. Yeah, I would add to that that uh, as a reviewer, I started recently uh, when I review for a good journal, if I review for last, something that is not as good and I'm not as strict, uh, asking uh, for or analysis logs, mostly mm -hmm. OSM. And then uh, I realized that some authors don't know what OSM is. So I, I, in my next review, I will include step-by-step -step instructions on how to do it. And then there is no excuse for not doing it anymore. So you said they don't include OSM? OSF, you know, oh, oh, open, okay. open Science Foundation is a web, uh, it's, uh, they host a website where you can post code, post results, post data for free, and it allows you to have an anonymous link, so you can provide an anonymous link to the reviewers that see the name of your project, they see the revision history of your project, when you post it there, and uh, what you post it, but they don't see who you are, and that's a great resource, so that is something that you can do. And also, in, in teaching, uh, I tell my students that everything that you got, that you do in state, I must go and do to a do file, and you need to document the do file well enough that it is uh, ready to be published if someone asks for it. And is that safe um, or approved by like the IRB? Are they okay with that? Do you have IRB in your school? Uh, well, we don't, okay. uh, and uh, this school is not subject to it. So uh, the psychologists have to go to an ethics review. We don't. So we can be unethical. <laughs> <laughs> but if you just post analysis logs, they, they are going to be something that would uh, just just more more detail about what is the result. It doesn't show the identities of the points. Of Perfect. course, informal identities can be real. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. 
and the website for OSF is osf.io. And if you guys are not using it, I strongly encourage you to use it for the purposes of transparency. You, some people will post usually anonymized data sets there uh, for the purposes of reproduction, reanalysis, et cetera. But generally, you can find people posting their code there. You can find people posting um, analyses there. If they're doing a multiverse analysis or sensitivity analysis, you might see a bunch of different decisions that they made and what the outcomes of those decisions were. So that doesn't bleed into journal space and things like that. Um, if you're doing a simulation study, people will post <coughs> the prompts there. And very, very often, you will find people who are posting their measures there. Uh, just for full transparency in the review process. It stays anonymized until the, the paper is published and then it get linked, gets linked to that paper and they, the entire system is set up there. I think the Beyond OSF is a great solution. Um, it's very important for reviewers to let you know what they want to know. So they can't just say, we want this to be more transparent. They have to say, we want to see X specifically, Y specifically. Editors need to manage that process to some extent as well. But as authors, I think it, the onus is really on us to basically let our readers know what we did and why we did it. And I don't, as an associate editor, I don't mind giving more journal space to transparency. Um, some people disagree. Some editors and reviewers will, of course, disagree with that. Um, online supplements exist. We have infinite virtual space these days. OSF exists. And so there's really no excuse to leave it out, in my opinion. So if you've made a decision about transforming data, if you have uh, uh, used a cutoff score and you've got specific scores for you know, faking uh, for each participant, person scores for faking, if you have uh, careless responding scores, you can post those things alongside your analyses that you chose. But more is always better when it comes to transparency. If you want to have an example, then uh, we just published a paper in JFP on War Family Conflict. I'm the second author, and I was the, the, the Methods Guy in the paper. Uh, we, we posted, uh, the readers were asking for all kinds of things, like how about careless respondents, how about men, how about women, like all kinds of exclusions, and we just ran our, our M plus models in the next thing with all the configurations, and it produced 600 output files. It's all on our set, and then we provided a summary uh, in the next thing to the readers. You can just like see what we did. What was the name of that paper again? I don't remember the name of the paper, but it's about work family conflict. And I cannot, pro I cannot pronounce the name of the first author because it's Polish and it doesn't have any vowels. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Actually, I'm going to um, move us to the next question, if that's OK, um, for the sake of time. So the next question is, what are the future trends you see in data preparation? Where is the field headed? I think for future trends, still, I think I'm still going to agree with transparency. It's like just be very detail oriented about what you have done with your data and also try to make your consumption scripts as detailed as possible. I think that's definitely the way to go because I came from a psychology background. So, a few years, well, decades ago, there has been some you were talking, you were talking about replication processes. Actually, I haven't seen a lot of you know, efforts in our field doing similar things, but I do think that's very important. Really because to, you know, we, if we want to move forward as a science, we need to make sure that our results can be validated. I think this is a very important part. And also one thing I want to add to what the previous discussion about transparency is like, for example, uh, in your paper, you should definitely also, in a, not only mention which software you use, and also make sure you mention what's the version. Especially if you are using R packages for analysis, it is very important to make sure you also document the version of the R package you use. Because sometimes people might make major updates to the R package, you might get different results. Or some of the previous code might not even run. So I think that's also something. A minor details, but I think that's really important. Um, Chime in real quick to just say that I think more research needs to be done on pattern responding. There's been a lot of stuff done in terms of uh, random responding and straight lining within the careless data literature, but more on pattern responding needs to be done. And there's current work that I already mentioned that's going on trying to tackle that, but it is understudied compared to those other two forms of carelessness. And so I think it would be good to look for holes like that and just try to build. We don't know. It doesn't pop out as a latent class when you do latent class analysis <coughs> of carelessness. And so 
it's probably less prevalent, um, or maybe it gets folded in statistically with something like straight lining, which is technically a pattern. And so, you know, maybe we can do more to <clears throat> identify various patterns and see what the prevalence of them are. Or if nobody's doing them and we just made them up as researchers, that's always possible too. Great points. Anything else? Okay, um, the next question was, could you share a specific challenge or case study from your experience? But I think that this, um, I chose this question to highlight the importance, and I think our speakers have highlighted the importance very well. And for the sake of time, I'd like to open up the questions to the audience. Um, and we only have one microphone, so I'm thinking of just leaving it up here for our panelists to answer questions, if you wouldn't mind just shouting out your question. <laughs> um, so, any questions? Yes, in the back. I had a question about uh, identifying outliers and, and being transparent about them in papers. To me, it very quickly feels like when you discuss outliers, that reviewers will or, uh, or editors will just say, oh, your model didn't work, you threw away some of the data, now it works. And how do you account for that? Yeah, great question. And th there's going to be some situations where we can't, right? That maybe there's it's not working. Um, and of course, we're, we don't want to do something that's unethical and report something that, that really isn't there. Uh, but at the end of the day, we've got to be able to justify our actions. So, um, and, and if we can justify our actions and it makes sense, uh, then, you know, in the sake of transparency, the editor or associate editor may guide you in the process of how to best communicate this information. Oh, or maybe, you know, put it on OSF and here was our original results. Um, and, and we don't necessarily talk about that in the paper, but we have another place where we kind of have that transparency. So I'll echo, you know, the, the comments that were made earlier is we are definitely moving towards greater transparency all around. And I think, um, the standards of methodology is continuing to go up, which requires greater explanations for, it feels like a hundred different things for any empirical paper. And we just don't have the space for that. So I think more and more, uh, we're gonna get used to online resources and that's the place where we may need to be doing some of that explanation, right? Some of that, a lot of that has been occurring to the letter to the reviewers uh, or back to the editor. Um, and, and they'll, they'll lay that out super well in, in that response, but then it doesn't go anywhere. I think in the future, we're gonna to start to see more of that being placed online. Um, and so that's, that's, that becomes the challenge for us, is how do we justify the decision making that we had? And, and I imagine that there's, if it's you know, justifiable, we'll be able to do it. And I think, uh, you know, our, our fellow colleagues will be open and supportive of that. Yeah, I would like to add that sometimes uh, your paper might be rejected if you drop off class if you do it in a stupid way. So I've rejected a paper, but it's a bad paper anyway, but uh, I rejected a, a paper that uh, dropped outliers based on, on standardized residual uh, greater than two in absolute value. So systematically drop everything uh, based on standard expression source. That, of course, increases R squared, or in place, quite a lot. Makes the model look good, but it's totally unjustified. So that kind of outlier removal will get you rejected. Yeah, great question. Is there another question in the audience? Yes. Uh, so, well, I wanted to ask Bo about taking measure of personality. So you talked about how, I know it, it's something recently developed and it's about personality. But I, was, I had two questions. One was in terms of when you have items that are, I talk about social reliability, that, have, that refer to negative behaviors. So personality tests typically don't have negative behavior. Sometimes we're trying to find out something about smoking or illegal drugs where they're negative. So does the RES method that you specified, does that work for those kind of behaviors as well and testing taking in those measures? And the other question, which is more personality related, is, um, is it robust or is it similar in both anonymous versus public responses? So I'm thinking, I'm asking undergraduates in an experiment group for personality versus I'm asking prolific or empirical to respond to personality. Does that capture picking the same way in both contexts? 
Uh, thank you so much. Uh, the, uh, as, for, as for the first question, so actually, yes, this model works for most of this kind of activity. There's actually the second mesh web paper I showed actually, this one was originally designed for you know sensitive questions like uh, whether you have to drugs or whatever. So actually, so yes, this model works for that type of behaviors. And then for your second question, so that's a really good one. I haven't, let me see. I, I think it worked both ways. I didn't see a great difference. Probably, for example, if you have a student sample and also a temperature sample, probably the degree where the uh, percentage of fakings uh, is different. And then in this case, it might influence the performance of this model. But I think in principle, this model should work in both cases, just probably to a different degree. Yeah. Any questions? Are there more questions? Yes, in the back. Well, um, first of all, I want to say thank you all for a great talk. So I wish everyone who does on stage research at the academy could hear what we've been saying. I think everyone can learn. They, they can. Uh, yeah. They can because it's on video. <laughs> <laughs> great. Um, I've got a question specifically for Martin about uh, the common method bias. Really interesting to hear that. Um, I was well aware that moderation, uh, it wasn't a problem. Uh, I was. Uh, I'm more surprised to hear about the mediation aspect of it, because uh, uh, I, I, I would have thought there would be more of an issue with mediation than common method bias. So I wonder if you could say a little bit more about why that is. So not intelligently, probably. Uh, that's not my forte. I apologize. I do know that one of the articles that I've been working on, it's under review right now, we should hear any, any day now whether it's going through, is that basically by the time you add a certain number of variables in any form to your model, somewhere between four to six variables. Those could be mediators, moderators, control variables, marker variables. By the time you add in four to six variables in addition to your bivariate relationship, there is very little chance that there is going to be common method bias driving your results. So that's where the mediators part comes in. For some reason, having a certain number of variables makes it such that you are not getting your results driven by that common method bias. Um, I have a, an Academy presentation from that. It's many years ago. We've had a hard time getting this article published. I'm happy to share the unpublished manuscript with you. I'm hopeful that in a few months we can share an in-press article, but uh, that's a bit premature at this point. Thanks. Yeah, to add to that, I, I wrote a conference paper about that topic like 15 years ago. I, I never ended up publishing it, but uh, the, the reason why adding more items makes your uh, Common method barriers problem or common method bias problem less is that if you think what regression does, it tells you what is the unique effect of each independent variable on the dependent variable, and if uh, your your items that explain the dependent variable all share the same source of error, then that is not unique to the items. So they basically are every every contaminated item acts as a bit of like a common method barriers control. What it does is that it inflates the R square. And uh, if I see an R square of, let's say, 80, explaining any human behavior, then, then uh, the authors have uh, some explaining to do. Or um, I've seen a, a strategy study saying that, that, that two variables explain 80% of variation of company performance. Then I asked the reader, is that should we just rename our field based on these two variables only, and not, not talk about anything else anymore? Uh, the paper was did not get a revision, so I don't know what the what the author would have responded. Excellent. Are there any other questions? I did have a question um, about common method variance. Do you have any rules of thumb that might help us understand when we should be concerned about common method variance and when not? Because I have also been made to believe that common method variance is a very serious problem. And, and you know, I'm not, I'm not saying it's not a serious problem. There are certainly times that I would look at a data collection and say, you know, I'm worried that there's going to be some error here because of the consistency motif or, you know, affectivity, whatever. But I think you need to think intelligently about where the method variance might be coming from. You know, is it because there's a strong mood component that's being captured here? Is it because someone is trying to make connections logically? You know, is there, uh, are the items written such that there are these demand characteristics where I'm very likely to answer strongly agree on things? Uh, you want high quality data, obviously. But 
if, if you include the ideal marker variable ahead of time, if you include, uh, they're sometimes called measured method or presumed cause variables like affectivity, social desirability, it's almost like you've got the tools then to protect yourself. So if on the back end somebody says, you've got common method bias that's affecting your data, you can run the CFA marker technique, or you can control for social desirability and say, well, we looked for it, we didn't find it, or we looked for it, we found it, and now we're controlling for it. Uh, the projects that I've done where we've reviewed published studies that have uh, analyses using the, common, uh, the CFA marker technique, we find very, very, very few incidences of contaminating common method variants. Now, this could be a file drawer problem. It could be that if I've got common method bias, I try to shop my survey around, nobody likes it, nobody publishes my paper. I'm working on a paper right now to address that by looking at dissertations. So far, we're not seeing much. Um, there's just not that high of an incidence. I, if we talk about the future of this field, I would love for people to not be so concerned about common method bias. I think it's a little overblown. And I think it's to the, the point that it's causing people to do strange things with their data collection that don't make sense conceptually. You know, they're putting a time lag in, they're doing multi-source, they're doing all this stuff when maybe it doesn't make as much sense conceptually. But that's an unpopular opinion. Uh, and I'll add to that that it's very important to make sure you're measuring things well yes. and appropriately before you start worrying about all the things that can go wrong with it. Thank you. Um, but to, to echo what Marcia said, and it's in the Plastic Off article from 2012 as well, um, yeah, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Uh, once you are at the point where you know you have a problem, if you haven't planned for that, by you've got a great measure that can be used as a, uh, you know, either a manifest or a latent yeah. <laughs> uh, marker variable, or you can, if it makes sense for that time lag, if you're doing a mediation model, time lag makes a lot of sense a lot of time, um, pretty much all the time. Uh, if, you are, if you are studying something at a different level, you should be getting data from different sources and so forth and so on. And so a lot of the best practices for measurement are not necessarily convenient, but for you know us collecting data, they are very convenient in terms of avoiding common method bias or common method variance in the first place. Uh, so yes, if you can separate by time, don't do it just because you know you think you're supposed to. Do it when it makes sense. But if you can separate the sources, do that when it makes sense. All of that stuff will mitigate uh, common method variance. All of that stuff will allow you to look at it after the fact as well and see if there is a problem. By the time, if you haven't done any of that stuff and you're looking for a statistical solution post hoc, those are much, much worse than the preventative measures that you can take. But again, all of that with the caveat that don't screw up your measurement just because you're worried the reviewer will say that. There are things that I call lazy reviewer comments. You need better theory without telling you anything more than that. You can say that about anything. Um, you might have an endogeneity problem. Yes, everybody has an endogeneity problem. You might have common method variance. Yes, that's possibly true. It's almost everything, almost every data collection I have ever seen in management suffers from those things. And so it's very, very low hanging fruit for reviewers. But if you're reviewing, have a reason for making those comments. If you are an author, have, uh, you know, just know about these things, know about data cleaning, know about faking, know about um, method variance, know about transformations, know about outliers, and have that plan in place before you start your data collection process. And if you do that, you're going to be able to get over, get over any slings and hurdles that your reviewers throw at you because you will be well prepared. Yeah, I would like to add on that they, um, there's a lot of things that are not currently covered in the, the literature on these uh, uh, common method variance models. And uh, one, one thing is that these, these models are not always identified. And, and the reason what it, be, what it means is that you have, if you have variables that are highly correlated because of, of uh, a causal relationship between the constructs that the variables are represent, and uh, the variables are, uh, another scenario is the variables are highly correlated. Uh, because of method variance. These are not always entirely distinguishable, so it is impossible to detect method variance. 
And what makes the situation really challenging in the physical brain, you have this kind of identification problem where you fit a bike actor model, which is a, uh, which they are, the metabarics model actually is. Uh, it, it can run on a computer and give you results without any warnings. And then you would have to know to do identification checks yourself, which most researchers are not trained to do. And then you publish your study uh, because you don't know that anything is wrong. But if you would increase your sample size, then the model will stop converging. And uh, I, I, I became friends with John Antonakis when I saw that his 2010 course of claims paper has this problem. Any other questions? All right, can we get a big round of applause for our panelists? And I just want to say thank you on behalf of the field for all that you do. This is a very important subject for all of our field and for everyone who relies on our conclusions. And I just want to encourage you guys to continue doing some great work. Uh, this is the slide where you can use your phone to scan for the materials. You can also you know, type in that link to your search bar, or if any, none of these are working, uh, you can email me. That's my email at the bottom. Also, if you want to see this again at another academy, maybe send me an email and I'll do it again, because this was really useful. I think it was fantastic. Um, so, with, were there any other comments? Yeah, we'll put the, uh, the recording to the same link. Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah, I will, I will, put, it. I will put it. Yeah, since it is my link, that makes sense. Yes, <laughs> excellent. Um, so that's it. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.